Yes, welcome everyone to uh, this uh, Radcliffe Chambers Junior Programme on Insolvency and Restructuring. Uh, I am James Fagan. I'm a junior tenant here at Radcliffe Chambers. I'm joined by my colleague, Mr. Piers Digby, um, who's giving you a wave there. And uh, today we will both be speaking on different topics. I am going to be speaking to you on the electrifying and stimulating uh, topic of CVAs and restructuring plans. I'm going to give you a brief high level introduction to you know, what they are, the context they exist in, et cetera. Uh, and uh, Piers is going to be speaking to you about uh, administration uh, extension applications and what to do when they go wrong and how to fix them. Um, and so uh, without further ado then, I think I will get going. Uh, just please bear with me while I get my slides going. So uh, what will I be talking to, to you about today? First, I'm going to look at some key figures on the use of uh, company voluntary arrangements, CBAs, uh, and restructuring plans under Part 26A, the Companies Act. Uh, I'll then have a look at how each procedure works in practice, the various stages uh, and tests that are applied. I'll then uh, speak to you about some of the key case law, uh, which I think you'll need to bear in mind uh, if you're ever faced with either of the, these um, insolvency arrangements, uh, and indeed, uh, which you may wish to look into in further detail, including uh, the very recent decision uh, of the Court of Appeal, which represents the first Court of Appeal decision uh, in respect of restructuring plans. Uh, and finally, then to wrap up, I'll, I'll sort of touch on uh, who exactly uh, the various uh, who, who plans are for, uh, what type of companies and the barriers to using uh, them, in particular restructuring plans. So, uh, Let's talk about some key figures uh, relating to CVAs and restructuring plans. Uh, the Insolvency Service, uh, which is a branch of government uh, agency uh, in BIS, uh, deal uh, sets out some regular statistics. Uh, the most recent of these were released at the end of January, uh, and they're very helpful for indicating overall trends. So uh, that first question about how many restructuring plans there have been uh, since Part 26A was introduced. Well, between uh, 26th of June 2020 and the 31st of December 2023, 22 companies have had a restructuring plan registered at Companies House. So uh, not a gigantic number, uh, but when you consider how expensive they are and the size of the companies, you know, it's a it's a fairly swift uptake uh, in, in, in certain industries. Uh, what about CVAs then? Well, last year there was 185 uh, company voluntary arrangements. So what we can see from the get-go is that CVAs uh, outnumber restructuring plans uh, by a factor of eight, and that's just simply, uh, you know, last year versus the entire life of restructuring plans. Uh, and the number of 185 is an increase from 2022, um, which was in fact the lowest ever total going back to 1993. Uh, there is, uh, but it, we're still down on the peak uh, and numbers are low. Uh, and, and when we say numbers are low, I think it's important to put this in the context of other insolvency processes. So last year, uh, there were 25,000, over 25,000 company insolvencies, uh, which is higher than the last peak, which occurred in 2009, around the time of the great financial crisis. And indeed, you'd have to go back uh, 30 years to 1993 again uh, for an even higher peak number. And within a breakdown of last year, you had over 20,000 uh, creditor uh, company voluntary liquidations, credit voluntary liquidations, 2,800 uh, compulsory uh, liquidations by the court, over 1,500 administrations. And so we can see that the 185 uh, CVAs are a very small drop in the ocean um, in you know, comparison to those other insolvency processes. Um, and uh, we can see also that restructuring plans are, are, are dwarfed. Um, and, and I think it's interesting when we look at well, what companies are using these, um, looking at sort of recent case law uh, coming through the courts and indeed economic news, we can see that uh, particularly affected sectors are both the retail sector uh, and uh, commercial landlords. Uh, both of these sort of areas of business seem to be feeling the most pressure. And, and indeed there's a tug of war between I think the, the those in the retail sector, uh, the commercial tenants, uh, and their landlords due to difficult trading conditions and the wider economy and reducing the need for commercial space. So 
Uh, currently, the trend is to see uh, you know, retailers and landlords uh, locked in these insolvency processes. So um, with that out of the way, how do CVAs operate in practice? Well, I think as a generalization, uh, a CVA can be seen as a means to reduce the debt burden of a company. Uh, there's flexibility, but commonly what you'll see uh, is it's an offer to pay a certain value in the pound, say uh, 75p for every one pound in debt over a particular timeline, uh, or indeed to pay 100 pence in the pound, uh, but to extend out the timeline for payment. Uh, and typically this will be proposed on the basis that if the company were to go into liquidation or some other insolvency process such as administration, creditors will get far, far less because of the disorderly breakup of the business. Uh, in terms of the type of entities that are allowed to enter, uh, if any companies registered under the Companies Act 2006, uh, European Economic Area Incorporated Companies, uh, companies which have their centre of main interest, their COMI, either in the EEA or the UK, uh, and indeed uh, limited liability partnerships uh, are also eligible to uh, enter into CVAs. Uh, how they are structured is that all CVAs will have uh, what's called a nominee who then becomes a supervisor. Uh, these are best viewed as the person who helps develop and run uh, the CVA. They must be a qualified, uh, qualified to act as a insolvency practitioner. The process is that first, uh, there's going to be a proposal which identifies a nominee. Um, that proposal is typically uh, presented by the directors. It can also be presented by administrators of a company uh, or liquidators. If they do it, then there are slightly different rules uh, that apply in terms of the procedures uh, in, in getting it voted on and applied. Uh, but you know, typically, it's not a case that a director will just come up with a proposal uh, and then put it to the nominee. Uh, usually there's quite a lot of work that happens before the proposal is created, uh, before the steps are run through uh, under the Insolvency Act. Uh, there are certain minimum information requirements on, uh, which are required under the insolvency rules uh, in 2.2 and uh, 2.3. Uh, well, it's important to remember that those are minimum uh, requirements uh, it, it is advisable that any proposal uh, can include, and indeed should probably include, uh, provisions as to the settlement in full uh, of all claims, uh, restrictions on creditors bringing claims they are bound by the CVA, uh, indemnities for the nominee and supervisor, uh, and also powers therein for the supervisor to uh, modify as necessary. Uh, it's also a, a requirement that the company uh, provides a statement of affairs uh, to effectively set out its financial position. Uh, and then if the nominee consents, which, you know, if, if it's been done properly and they've been involved in the process, they probably will consent. Uh, they have to submit a report to court uh, saying that the CVA, as proposed, uh, both uh, has a reasonable prospect of being approved by creditors and also of being um, and that it then should be put to the creditors for their consideration, uh, specifying a date, time uh, and place uh, for the decision-making process. Uh, what's important to note is you cannot use what's called the deemed consent procedure uh, under the uh, Insolvency Act and Insolvency Rule. You need to use a qualifying decision-making procedure as set out in uh, Rule 15.3. Uh, and the decision must be taken uh, and made no more than 28 days after the report is filed at court. And what effectively then is happens is you go off uh, after your report, you have the decision process. Uh, as you'll see there, there's effectively two requirements for it passing. There is a, uh, it has to be approved by 75% of creditors in terms of value, um, must vote in favour of it, uh, but also there cannot be a majority in number who vote against. Uh, and if it's passed, it effectively creates what is in essence a statutory contract uh, that binds uh, the creditors um, who had notice or indeed would have had notice. Um, well, if there's two things that are important to note here. First is that there is no moratorium uh, on uh, taking other insolvency actions um, or, or, or such as petitioning to wind up a company. Although if, if there's a petition presented, typically you'll, you'll find that there will be 
uh, an adjournment granted to allow consideration uh, of the CVA by the creditors. And secondly, it does not bind secured or preferential creditors unless they agree. Uh, and so that is one of the great limitations um, of CBAs, uh, because obviously if you have your largest creditors are typically going to be your secure creditors uh, or your preferential creditors, then if you don't buy, if you can't bind them, uh, they could easily you know, decide to take enforcement steps, um, which will effectively undermine the success of the CBA. Uh, but notwithstanding that, I think it's a, it, it is an important uh, tool uh, and it, it does allow a sort of less formal uh, attempt at restructuring a company's debt burden than necessarily the restructuring plan, uh, which leads me nicely on to how uh, Part 26A restructuring plans work in practice. Um, this was introduced under the Corporate Insolvency and Governments Act uh, 2020. It uh, to insert Part 26A, uh, which is effectively closely modelled on schemes of arrangement, uh, but is different. Uh, it's heavily influenced by the Chapter 11 bankruptcy system in the US, uh, and its standout feature is what's known as the cross-class cram down, uh, which effectively allows uh, the plan to be imposed over the dissenting voice of certain classes of creditors uh, if the court so approves it. Um, in essence, it's a, it's a power to sanction uh, the restructuring notwithstanding dissent. Uh, eligibility is slightly more restricted uh, in the sense that a company has to have encountered or is likely to encounter financial difficulties that are likely to affect their ability to carry on business as a going concern. That's what's called the financial test. Uh, and I think it's it, it very, very broad. It's much broader than the Insolvency Act's uh, test for inability uh, to pay debts. There's a lot of elastic terms such as likely to encounter, will affect, may affect. And in my view, that's quite beneficial because it enables the restructuring plan to be used in a variety of situations and indeed uh, before uh, irreparable harm is you know, suffered by a, a given company or group of companies. Uh, there's also what's called the purpose test, uh, which is that the plan itself must be a compromise or arrangement proposed between the company and its creditors or any class of them uh, and its members or any class of them for the purpose of eliminating, reducing, preventing, or mitigating the effect of the financial difficulties in question. Uh, it has been said in case law that there is, of course, a, there is actually a fourth condition, which is that uh, the company itself by its directors, shareholders, uh, or office holders consents and agrees to enter into the plan. Uh, in terms of you know, the pro process by which a plan uh, is created uh, and entered. Uh, first, uh, there's an application made to court to convene a meeting. So similar to previous uh, cases of CBAs, uh, you, you create your plan, you come up with this, and you report you, you report in court. But unlike CBAs, you actually have to have a first hearing. Uh, and at that hearing, the company applicant is expected to address things such as uh, how the meetings are going to be constituted, uh, the jurisdiction of the court, jurisdiction of Part 26A to propose a plan, uh, what, what issues might be relevant to satisfying uh, the, the financial test and the purpose test, uh, and also any other issue uh, which doesn't relate to the merits or fairness of the plan, uh, but which might lead uh, to a refusal to sanction. Uh, and then if the court is satisfied, having heard those submissions, uh, it will direct the, the holding of the creditors meeting. Um, and again, this is, you know, whoever's running the plan goes off to, to, to convene a creditors decision-making process. Uh, and then there are uh, requirements for majorities um, of the creditors or members summoned. Uh, similarly, we're looking at 75% uh, in value of the creditors or members uh, or of a class of creditors or members as may be in attendance and voting in person or by proxy. Um, and unlike schemes of arrangement, uh, there's no additional 
uh, requirement uh, for a majority in number. And again, that's uh, a, di a difference to CVAs, which did in fact require that majority in number. Um, but then there's, of course, what happens if there's dissent? And this is where the unique feature of the cross class cram down comes in. Um, and what this means is that a dissenting class of voters cannot block the plan if at the second hearing the court is satisfied that none of the members of the dissenting class would be worse off than under a relevant alternative, typically uh, is going to be some form of administration, liquidation uh, or alternative plan. And then, of course, that 75% uh, uh, by value of the class of creditor members uh, which would receive a payment or have a genuine economic interest uh, still voting in favour of the plan. So you see, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a much more um, involved process. Uh, there's much more court oversight. Um, and indeed, it, it does have scope for causing, I think, uh, greater prejudice to creditors. Um, and, and, and the courts, as we will see, are, are becoming much more alive to the risk of prejudice. And indeed, as we come on to the AGPS case, uh, that, that is at the forefront of the court's minds. Um, so uh, moving on now to the case law that you need to be aware of. Um, in relation to CVAs, um, I think the main thing to, 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 for, for, for litigators to be aware of uh, is how a uh, CVA might be challenged. Uh, and typically they're brought on two grounds set out in section six uh, of the Insolvency Act, uh, unfair prejudice and material irregularity uh, in the meeting or decision-making procedure. Um, prejudice uh, is, is not really an issue because by their nature, CVAs will involve some form of prejudice to creditors. Uh, the question the courts will be looking at uh, is whether, a, uh, whether the prejudice is in fact unfair. The court will look at all of the circumstances uh, the information available to the uh, creditors at the time of approval uh, and not at the time the court comes to hear it. Uh, the court will compare uh, what is being proposed under the CVA to what might happen if there is no CVA, i.e. if the company enters liquidation. Uh, and it will be looking at how different classes of, treated, uh, of creditors are treated. Uh, and in, in short, the, the court uses two tests called the horizontal and the vertical comparators. The vertical comparator is looking at the position of the challenging creditor in liquidation. Uh, so I think when, when faced with CVA, you always need to make sure you're aware of what is the outcome in a liquidation versus what is being proposed. And then there's what's called the horizontal comparator, which is the position between creditors. Um, different treatment is merely the starting point. Different treatment does not mean it is automatically uh, unfairly present judicial. Um, it has to be looked at in all the circumstances. And this, I think uh, the best case uh, for you to look at uh, to sort of get up to speed on this is Lazari Properties, uh, the New Look Retailers case. Um, in, in, in that case, the court emphasised uh, the fair allocation of assets between classes of creditors, the nature and extent of the different uh, treatment, uh, the justification that's being given for those different treatments, uh, and whether similarly positioned creditors had voted against uh, the arrangement or not. So that, that's what unfair prejudice is all about. You're, you're really getting into the details uh, of, of the proposal itself and how it affects that individual or class of creditors who are challenging it. Turning to material irregularity, this is much more procedural challenge. Uh, what what is what is the test is that there's been a material irregularity, which is, means that something has happened that is likely to have affected the outcome of the vote. Um, you know, it's an objective assessment that the court makes, uh, but it, it will take into account in certain circumstances uh, subjective views of, of creditors about whether they would have acted differently or indeed acted the same regardless of uh, these alleged irregularity. Um, issues that typically arise uh, concern disclosure failures, uh, decisions on voting, and indeed uh, applications of uh, discounts on creditor claims, uh, which of course affect then their voting rights. But of course, none of that really matters unless it can be shown uh, to have an impact 
and, and, and by way of uh, example, uh, Caraway Guilford is a, is a useful case for just uh, seeing how material irregularity is dealt with by the courts. Um, what I should note is that there have been attempts to make jurisdictional challenges. Uh, and what this means is that the, for, for whatever reason, the CBA jurisdiction on the Insolvency Act does not apl apply to the proposal in question, um, to the type of company. In Debenhams Retail, which was a 2019 decision, uh, landlords argued that CBAs uh, could not apply to compromised proprietary rights, uh, in that case, rights to forfeiture. Uh, and the court agreed, the court held that that fell outside of the scope of CBAs. What the court did do, though, however, in that case is uh, exercise an inherent jurisdiction to strike out the offending provisions of the CBA. Uh, in Lazari, uh, there was an argument that different deals with different subgroups of creditors uh, had brought the uh, proposals outside the meaning of a composition in satisfaction of debt uh, scheme of arrangement of its affairs under Section 1.1 of the Insolvency Act. Uh, but ultimately, that was rejected by the court. I took a much broader proposal approach uh, of what was being attempted. Uh, and so I think in reality, jurisdictional challenges, while they may be attempted, aren't necessarily going to be uh, successful in uh, tanking uh, a CBA. Turning to uh, restructuring plans, I think the key case law that you will want to be aware of are those that are set out on the slide, uh, slides here. So in terms of financial test, um, the threshold is low. Uh, it's not going to be necessarily the most complicated of analysis as to whether or not uh, financial difficulties are likely for the company. Um, in terms of how class composition is to be approached, it's to be the same test of schemes of arrangement. Um, what, what, what the real focus is actually on the specific rights of given classes of creditors, rather than necessarily their identity as, let's say, landlords or uh, note holders. Um, you need to look at, well, what are, what are, what are the specific rights uh, and how do they differentiate within within those kind of broader classes. Um, and then uh, in relation to notice um, that has to be given to creditors, uh, what the courts are expecting is uh, at a bare minimum, a comparator between what the outcome of the plan is uh, and uh, is it better than a relevant alternative being some other form of insolvency procedure. Uh, and I think this is, you know, there's a, there's a commonality here between uh, restructuring plans, CVAs, and et cetera. There's, you know, the, the difference here is we, you know, the courts want to know what is happening, you know, if we're going to go ahead with this amendment of people's rights versus, you know, if, if the co company is just allowed to, to trade into difficulties and, and being ground up. Um, there's, there, there's some ideal information that should be included as was set out in Sunbird. So uh, on the treatment of classes, the assumptions, valuation methodology, um, and, and, and financial and commercial interest uh, of, of, of the directors. So you know, there's a lot of work that goes into these plans. And I think the, the, the recipe for success is to ensure that you, you it's prepared uh, with the input uh, of, of, financial, of the financial advisors, the IPs, uh, and, and a lot of work goes into it. And indeed, in the cases that have come, uh, there has been a huge amount of work gone in. And I think as we get on to now my next slide, it's going to become more important uh, following the decision in uh, AGPS Bond Co. Uh, this is a decision of the Court of Appeal that was only handed down there uh, at the end of January, uh, beginning of February. Uh, it's our first decision on restructuring um, it's 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 important because it actually overturns uh, a first instance sanctioning uh, of a uh, restructuring plan. So uh, what at a very high level, what this appeal was about was uh, it was by a group of dissenting note holders. Um, there was an attempt to uh, have a cross class cram down, which was sanctioned by Justice Leach at the uh, first instance. Um, AGPS uh, is a group of companies uh, that's engaged in the residential real estate market in Germany. 
Uh, it had attempted numerous restructurings after uh, a, a large downturn. Uh, it had faith. Uh, uh, while it had previously attempted restructuring using a Luxembourg entity, um, there was an attempt to use its uh, an English company within the group uh, to find, find jurisdiction here and use the restructuring plan. In terms of the cross-class cram down, uh, there were six classes of bondholders, five of whom uh, voted in favour, but in one, the required 75% majority was uh, not achieved. Uh, and, and the people who had, the note holders that had voted against uh, were those whose uh, maturity of the loan notes were going to be extended the furthest into 2029. Uh, and what they argued was that their, their extended later maturity uh, risked them being left unpaid uh, you know, at the you know at their expense and to the benefit of those with earlier maturity dates. In in short, that uh, they were taking the risk that the 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 pool of money would be used up by those ahead of them in the queue, uh, and they would be left with nothing. Um, they said there hadn't been good uh, reason for their di differential treatment, uh, which in essence had departed from the pari passu principle of uh, all creditors. Of the same rank bearing losses equally and ratedly. Uh, the Court of Appeal uh, agreed and they noted that had there been, uh, without adherence to Pari Passu, um, there, there was this risk of the later note holders being uh, left unpaid. Uh, what the Court stated was sequential payments to creditors from a potentially inadequate common fund of money uh, are not the same thing as a ratable distribution of that fund. Uh, the court said that the key issue uh, in exercising its discretion to impose a plan on a dissenting class is to identify whether the plan provides for differences in treatment, different classes of creditors inter se, and if so, can those differences be justified? Uh, and I think this judgment is very helpful uh, because it then uh, goes on to look at some of the points, having, having emphasised pari passu, uh, being a key consideration. Uh, it, the judgment goes on to consider uh, how one assesses that fairness. And uh, the points to, to sort of note on that uh, is that the first is that, yes, the, the scheme of arrangement uh, case law in relation to class comp composition uh, is uh, applicable in restructuring plans. However, uh, where and indeed the rationality test and principles uh, of of sanctioning a scheme of arrangements apply where there is no cross class cram down. But where the cram down is requested, uh, the rationality principles uh, developed in 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 schemes of arrangement are only applicable in a limited sense. Uh, the court uh, cannot uh, use it uh, to assess different classes. What the court said that what we must do is, in fact, engage with the underlying commercial rationale of the plan. Uh, a judge cannot simply apply a rationality test uh, and, and, and that's it. There needs to be uh, an investigation and consideration of, 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 of the underlying commercial effects, uh, rationale, justification, uh, however you might want to describe it. Uh, but uh, notwithstanding the limiting of uh, scheme of arrangement case law, uh, the court did say that the use of the horizontal and vertical comparators from our CVAs uh, may uh, actually be applied uh, with some modification. So I think what we can see coming out of this case is that the cases on unfair prejudice under CVAs uh, is going to hold, are going to hold lessons how to approach uh, restructuring plans and how to determine whether differing outcomes uh, for different classes of creditors are both justifiable and fair. So I think that that that's interesting, I think, to note that the courts are willing to uh, look at tests that have been applied in other uh, procedures uh, and decide, you know, and, and, and pick and choose what are helpful for uh, approaching the ultimate question, which is, can, can this all be justified? Is it fair? Uh, and, and is the commercial rationale uh, going to stand up to scrutiny? The, the courts, emphasize that the size of support for a plan is irrelevant to determining the commercial merits or fairness. So 
the, the Court of Appeal here, I think, is signalling that uh, for, for going on into the future, there's going to have to be a lot of uh, investigation into what is actually being proposed rather than how popular it is uh, between the different classes of creditors. Um, the court stated that courts have to consider uh, alternative plan proposals. So not simply is uh, the plan a better option than uh, liquidation or some other form of um, insolvency procedure, but is there a better plan or a fairer plan with a different allocation of restructuring surplus uh, that could have been put to the creditors? And if so, how would it compare? So there's a, that was a direct rejection of uh, the approach that had been taken at first instance, which said the court didn't have to consider that. And so I think overall, what this case, AGPS Banco, uh, is useful for, it's not that it's setting out strict criteria uh, that all courts have to follow. And I don't think, uh, I think it would probably be premature for the courts to be setting out strict criteria. Uh, what it's setting out is a guidance on the appropriate tests to be applied um, again, emphasizing comparison uh, analysis, both vertically and horizontally, uh, between not just insolvency procedures, but alternative plans, in order to uh, get courts to assess the commerciality of the plan and not simply uh, the levels of support. It has. So I think, you know, that that makes sense, given how flexible uh, restructuring plans are intended to be. They're not one size fits all. Uh, they're, they're always going to be tailored to the given uh, type of company uh, business you're dealing with. Uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out going forward. Uh, but it does mean, I think, in my opinion, uh, that we're going to see that cross class cram downs are going to be subject to a lot more scrutiny based on their economic or commercial effects. Uh, and I think this uh, then leads on to uh, the next point to be considered, which is, well, who are these procedures for? Um, one of the big uh, issues that we have uh, with restructuring plans uh, are their costs. Uh, I put up a, a, a case there uh, on, on, on the slides, um, called CBI, uh, CBNI UK Limited. Uh, that involved a six day trial, two days of judicial pre-reading. Pre uh, the group in question had over 300 legal entities uh, and was in uh, the oil and gas industry. Uh, in the introduction, Mr. Justice Green said this, I was horrified to discover that the plan company has spent around 150 million US dollars on professional fees in negotiating with its secured creditors uh, and then putting forward the plan and taking it to this hearing. That is an enormous sum of money, even taking into account the fact that it includes the cost of supporting creditors as well. The group actually raised 250 million US dollars of new money while the plan was being negotiated, principally to fund the professional fees for getting the plan. Now, uh, the judge went on to note that the costs of that magnitude could be a barrier to the sort of restructurings that Part 26A uh, was meant to encourage. But I think it's a, it's a, it's a warning sign uh, that the cost of these restructurings uh, can be eye-watering. Um, and while CB&I is probably an outlier, a cursory review of the uh, restructuring plan gone through the courts to date uh, indicate the costs are likely to be in the region of two to 10 million pounds. Uh, you're looking at lengthy hearings, large council teams, sophisticated uh, legal teams and financial teams. And so if the courts are going to require greater consideration and analysis of the underlying financials, commerciality uh, and alternatives, I think that's just going to drive up costs more. It's going to drive up the complexity more, uh, which means that uh, there's not really much use for these uh, restructuring plans outside of large uh, conglomerate, multi-border, uh, cross-border uh, companies uh, with with giant revenue uh, sheets uh, and balances uh, in the hundreds of millions. Uh, there have been some suggestions for reducing costs, like using uh, ICC judges. Uh, determining these uh, restructuring plans on paper. But the reality is, uh, if you look at what the case law says, judges are going to require lots of information. Uh, and that's going to, I think, increase, uh, given what is said in AGPS, uh, as, as the courts are forced to reckon with commercial details. And so we're really only going to see a, a, an increased complexity 
in these. And I think it's just worth bearing in mind that uh, restructuring plans, I just don't think are really suitable for SMEs. Um, and it's unclear if they can ever be appropriate for them. Uh, CBAs, on the other hand, are comparatively, their orders of magnitude uh, less expensive. Uh, they're usually going to cost in the tens of thousands rather than in the hundreds or in the millions. Uh, and, I, and I think that they're much more appropriate and flexible for uh, smaller companies. And, and I do think that's a shame because uh, if we look at UK uh, Parliament research, SMEs actually make up 99% of businesses in the UK. So we have restructuring plans which have been heralded as this uh, great new modern way of restructuring, uh, but they're really only applicable to uh, the one percent uh, of companies out there in this country, and even then, probably a, a much smaller fraction of those, uh, given the size and given the complexity. Um, and so, I've, I've noticed that there's been a couple of questions. So, the first question is um, with restructuring plans, escaping uh, reporting and oversight procedures in admin liquidation CVAs. Uh, do I think the commercial merits of pursuing large sums? Uh, which will rank as unsecured debts, has been reduced. Um, I think the, the reality of that is uh, the reporting uh, and oversight procedures um, of restructuring plans are actually quite significant. Uh, you have the first hearing, the second hearing. If uh, you are a large creditor, of course, uh, you, may, you may find yourself outvoted, you may find yourself uh, in a crammed down class. That doesn't necessarily mean you cannot challenge. Um, and, uh, and yes, of course, sums can be compromised. Um, large arbitral claims um, may be compromised, but uh, fundamentally, if you think that this is unfair, you can challenge. Um, it may be that there is a good commercial justification. Uh, uh, you know, $1 billion arbitral award um, is, is not going to be worth much if uh, there's going to be a disorderly liquidation and you're going to rank as a, uh, a, an unsecured creditor with a much smaller uh, pence in the pound than you necessarily get under the restructuring plan. Uh, and then uh, there's a question about, do I see the uh, potential for RPs to be challenged under section 423 uh, if there's been any form of material omission? Well, I think that, that's an interesting question. Certainly CVAs can be challenged after they've concluded um, on the basis of uh, unfair prejudice, or some form of material irregularity. And I think if if it, if there's been found to be a material omission or hiding off of assets, such that I think, you know, what I think this question is driving at, has there been a fraud against the creditors? Well, you know, the English courts take a fairly robust view on frauds. If you can establish there's been an attempt to um, overstate or understate the balance sheet's asset position, uh, and that does affect the... Um, the, the, the restructuring plan, by all means, I think I think that there are there will be scope to challenge. Um, and, and with looking at the time, um, I'd like to thank you all for listening. Um, if you have any further questions, put them in the Q and A box uh, or get in touch with our events team. Uh, and with that uh, ended, I'll now hand over to Piers. Thank you. Thanks, James. That was a. Uh... Um, really interesting look into um, something that's uh, an area of um, insolvency and restructuring that's been changing a lot, a lot of shifting ground lately. Um, I'm going to be uh, taking uh, you from uh, perhaps that uh, high level view to um, something that might be more um, day to day bread and butter in terms of um, what you're doing. Uh, and that is uh, going to be, uh, as was mentioned, um, uh, applications for uh, extensions and administrations. So how you can make sure you get them right the first time and uh, if they go wrong, what you can do to fix that. So I will just uh, take a moment to bring up my slides. So you found yourself in an, uh, an administration. The usual principle, of course, under paragraph 76 of the Insolvency Act 1986 uh, is that uh, after a year, um, that's it. You've come to an end. The administration um, uh, lapses uh, and is over without anyone having to take uh, any more specific uh, step. Um, obviously, that's not great. If you're not finished, uh, you're not done. You feel there's more to get out of it. So um, if the IP comes to you and says, look, I want this to keep going, you've got two ways to do so. One is the consent of the company's creditors, and one is a court order. 
Now, uh, although uh, I'm here today to predominantly talk you through um, effectively the, the, the court process, it's almost always going to be the case that um, by the time uh, you come to make a court application, you'll have already sought consent of the company's creditors. And that's just because it's a much um, easier, a much more straightforward process. Um, the, the limit is that you can only do it once. So you'll go to the company's creditors, you'll get your, your OK. And then effectively, at that point, if you're if you're two years in, that's when you're going to be going to the court uh, for the first time. That still means we need to consider the process for consent of the company's creditors, though. Uh, and the reason for that uh, is because the first issue that the court is going to ask itself is um, whether this administration is still going. So um, paragraph 77 uh, to Schedule B, one of the Insolvency Act, is very clear that uh, an order for extension um, cannot be made after the expiry of the administrator's term of office, except for some um, very rare situations that, that mostly relate to court faults and uh, Ray TT Industries gives a bit of an insight into those. So the trouble that the court has is that if you turn up as uh, uh, an administrator who uh, attempted to get an extension from the creditors uh, and didn't manage to correctly do so, then in fact, you're not actually an administrator. It has lapsed and therefore um, there is no capacity uh, to give you that extension. That's why it's very important that you get it right and uh, very important that you understand uh, how extensions by consent work. So under paragraph uh, 78 uh, of uh, Schedule B1 to the Insolvency Act, um, you can see that consent is needed from each secured creditor and the unsecured creditors, if there are any, uh, unless administrators uh, have made the statement under paragraph 52.1b saying they do not expect distributions to be made to unsecured creditors other than via the prescribed part, um, uh, the part of, of uh, qualifying floating charges, which is sort of protected um, nonetheless uh, in part for uh, unsecured and preferential creditors. And that makes sense. Um, right. If you're saying we don't expect any distributions to be made uh, to you as an unsecured creditor, then you as an unsecured creditor, you don't really have any interest in whether the um, administration goes on either way. Um, so we can see why that works. But there is a subtle and important difference um, in the position of secured creditors and unsecured creditors. And you can see that uh, in the fact that in paragraph 78, uh, consent is needed from each secured creditor whereas uh, consent is needed from the unsecured creditors. Uh, so the former is being treated um, individually and the, the latter is being treated as a group, a, a class. Uh, and that's repeated uh, in uh, paragraph um, 72A, which, uh, sorry, 78A, uh, which is whether the company's unsecured creditors uh, or preferential creditors consent is to be determined uh, by the administrator seeking a decision from those creditors as to whether they consent. Uh, and that's the language uh, of Section 2467E of the Insolvency Act uh, 1986. Um, talks about uh, the seeking of decisions uh, and uh, describes the various um, decision procedures you can use to do so, um, one of which is the deemed consent procedure. So that's saying in respect of unsecured creditors, because you are seeking a decision from them in a sort of capacity as group, as a capacity as a class, then they fall under... Um, the sort of group of people you can ask um, deemed consent from, that does not apply to uh, secured creditors. You need to go to your secured creditors, you need to um, effectively say to them individually, uh, are you okay with this? Um, it's not sufficient to rely on putting a notice up saying you have this long to object, and then assuming that if they don't reply, uh, that you're good to go. Um, and uh, that is such a significant mistake um, that it is not a procedural error that you can fix under Rule 12.64 of the Insolvency Rules, um, which is a, a general uh, rule you can use to weigh procedural defects. Um, so that, that can be used in respect of some problems with the deemed uh, consent procedure, and we'll look at that shortly. But in this case, where well, you haven't gone to a secured creditor or have tried to use deemed consent with them, then that has in fact meant that your attempt to extend by creditor's consent uh, failed and that the administration lapsed um, a, a long time back. As well as that uh, definite mistake, um, which is reasonably well known, there's also a more subtle mistake, uh, and that is um, who exactly qualifies as a secured creditor. So even if you know that you need to ask the secured creditors individually, um, you might still miss some. And that's because of the wording of Rule 1511 uh, uh, of the Insolvency Rules, um, which provides for notice to be delivered to uh, the creditors who had claims against the company at the date when the company entered administration, except for those who have subsequently been paid in full. And that seems to make sense, right? Suppose you were a um, secured creditor uh, at the start of the administration, 
uh, and then during the course of the administration, for whatever reason, your security is realised, um, and now um, you are not seeking any particular debt. You don't have a claim um, against that company uh, subsequent to the realisation. Well, it, it makes sense that no one would come to you to say, should we extend the administration? You no longer have any interest in it. It's, it's paid you. you know, you're out of there as far as you're concerned. So that, that would certainly seem to be um, what the situation is at first glance. Unfortunately, it may not be as simple as that. And we can see that in the um, uh, first review of the insolvency uh, rules by the insolvency service in, in 2016. Um, and uh, you'll note here that um, it has been the government's position for some time that the classification of a creditor is set at the point of entry to the procedure. And this remains even if payment in full is subsequently made. Uh, and that's related back to um, Rule 14.1 of the Insolvency Rules, um, which defines um, a debt uh, as uh, not only present debts, but debts which arose on the relevant date, which is the, the date that the company entered into administration. So a creditor is someone with a debt, that's tautologically true, uh, and uh, a debt um, arises uh, on the date of administration, and, and that just is how debt is defined for the insolvency rule. So it persists. And so uh, under this logic, under uh, the government's logic, you ought to be going to uh, fully pay secured creditors and still asking for their consent. Um, and if you haven't done so, then uh, obviously that's not going to be a valid extension. And you, again, your administration has uh, in fact lapsed, which would be very problematic. Um, now, my view is that um, this is... A curious position, firstly, because even if you accept the argument about uh, the debt um, being defined when the company enters into administration, Section 248 of the Insolvency Act, uh, 1986, de defines a secured creditor as a creditor of the company who holds, in respect of his debt, a security over the property of the company. So even if de debt is defined by the entering into of the administration, the, the the security, that's present tense, that's holds, uh, not did hold or has held. And there's no other indication that, that that security relates back. So partly it conflicts with the statutory language. But secondly, and, and on face, it just doesn't make much sense to say that um, someone who is fully paid up and therefore no longer really has any interest in the administration uh, ought to be consulted. Um, nevertheless, we don't have a clear ruling on this point yet. So it's probably better to be safe. Um, and when you go back and uh, uh, you're um, advising an IP and they ask about this, then you know you should be saying, well, off you go to everyone who has ever been a secured creditor um, uh, since the date of the uh, administration. Um, I would, however, say watch this space because the trouble that your administrator is going to find is that once a company has been fully paid off, it often just isn't interested in engaging. So you'll be sending off lots of lovely letters that say, please give your consent to this extension and you'll receive nothing back because they just don't care enough um, to be involved. And why would they? They're fully paid off. And because of that, um, you end up with um, or can end up with uh, finding it very difficult to get your extension. It's a real obstacle. Uh, and as a result of that, I think it's quite likely that we are going to see um, in the near future a case which um, has not perhaps um, succeeded in managing to get to the uh, pay, fully paid secured creditors, but has nevertheless proceeded on the basis that the, the extension was uh, valid. And so uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll find out more on that front soon. So in terms of your unsecured creditors, you obviously have the uh, deemed consent procedure um, uh, and always make sure you double check the requirements uh, of this because uh, there's, there's a whole load of them uh, and you really do not want to risk uh, falling afoul of one. So in terms of the uh, Insolvency Act itself, you've got Section uh, 246ZF, which um, lays out that creditors must be given or, uh, notice of the matter about which they are to make a decision. So in this case, that consent is sought for an extension of the administration. Uh, the decision that the person giving the notice proposes should be made, so that we want an extension. Um, the fact uh, that if the relevant number of creditors object, uh, the creditors are, are treated um, at, uh, sorry, that should be don't object. Uh, the creditors are treated as having made the proposed decision uh, and otherwise the decision is not made. Uh, and finally, the procedure for objecting. Then under Insolvency Rule 3.54, the notice must contain the reasons why the administrator is seeking an extension. 
Uh, continuing on under insolvency uh, rules 15.7, uh, the notice must contain um, the uh, statement that in order to object, you need to have uh, done so before the decision date and before that point, put in the proof of your claim in accordance with the rules. Um, a statement that is it is the convener's responsibility, um, so in this respect, the administrators, to aggregate uh, the objections to see if the threshold is met, the decision uh, uh, to be taken is not having been made. Uh, and then a, a bunch of procedural aspects uh, under uh, Insolvency Rule 15.8 uh, about identification, um, authentication and dating and so on. Uh, the final uh, requirement under 15.7 being the 14 minimum days notice. Now, a failure on these is uh, often, although not always, going to be less disastrous than uh, having failed to secure the consent of each secured creditor. And that's because Rule 12.64 uh, has been applied more widely um, in these sorts of cases. And so you can see um, uh, Ray ARG Mansfield Limited, um, in which the sort of bare principles were set out, but particularly uh, Ray Caversham Finance Limited, which I find interesting because of its application. So in this case, the um, notice that had been provided was defective uh, for two reasons. One was that it left out um, rules 15.83F and 15.83G, um, which are the rules that say, um, even if you are a creditor who has opted out of receiving notice, you're still permitted to vote. Um, that was easily disposed of by the court, because in this case, there were no opted out creditors. So obviously nobody was prejudiced. But secondly, there was nothing addressing Rule 3.54. So on the face of the notice, there was nothing saying that, uh, you know, this is why the administrators want to be able to keep going um, with the administration. Um, and uh, on the face of it, that actually seems quite a serious problem, because how can the um, uh, unsecured creditors really understand whether they ought to be in favour or against these proposals, if there's not a, a basis provided for why the administrators are recommending them? Uh, now, despite that, the covering letter that accompanied the notice made reference to the administrator's uh, progress report, um, saying how they've been getting along with the administration and uh, that they're um, required to supply. And it, in this case, the court considered that because anyone who received the notice had the covering letter, and because the covering letter referred to the progress report, and because the progress report referred to the outstanding issues in administration, um, that might not be resolved before it concluded. In fact, it was the case that a sufficiently interested um, unsecured creditor would have been able to find out that information. Uh, and so the fact that it wasn't provided immediately on the face of the notice um, was uh, a merely procedural defect and wasn't a, a substantive defect. Now, that's quite interesting, because if we were to uh, jump back a bit, um, you can see that the, the vast majority of the things that the noticed must contain are just general requirements of um, the insolvency rules. Um, and there is therefore um, you know, effectively a reasonable case that um, if you end up in this worst case scenario where you haven't explicitly included these, the fact that you have alluded to the insolvency rules and said something along the lines of, uh, you know, this notice given in accordance with the insolvency rules, well, in my view, there's a pretty good argument there that, you know, your unsecured creditor can go away and look up and see, oh, I need to object not later than the decision date, and oh, this is the procedure for how I object. And so that means that the, the list of um, absolutely critical things, which um, uh, would not be easily waived as a mere um, procedural flaw, is basically the things that the, the creditor would otherwise not be able to work out at all, either by reference to the progress report um, or by general reference to the insolvency rules. And uh, the list of those things is probably quite slim. So it's going to be, um, um, for, for example, the decision date, because you can't work that out from, from any other source. But for most of these, um, there's good reason to suppose that you shouldn't excessively panic. And it, it may be fixable um, as compo uh, compared to the secured creditor situation. So that's always good to know. Finally, in an interesting recent case, um, uh, Ray E Realizations uh, 2020 Limited. Um, this one is a little difficult to understand. What happened here was that uh, the uh, administrators sought consent from the creditors to an extension almost immediately after entering into administration. Um, and they uh, sent out a progress report, um, which effectively said, um, uh, if these reasons apply, will you give us an extension when we get to them? Um, and the, the creditors all went ahead and said yes. 
Um, the notice of extension itself wasn't filed until two months before the extension was due to end. Uh, no reason was provided under Rule 3.54, but they argued, look, this is like Cavisham referenced the progress report. That ought to be good enough. Now, Deputy ICC Judge Curl QC um, expressed doubts as to whether the reasons for which the extension was made and that which needed to be provided under Rule 3.54 were actually those expressed in the progress report, given the gap in time. And the situation might obviously have changed. As it happened in that particular case, and the point wasn't pursued further, um, but you do see a fairly hefty statement um, warning people off from making these kind of contingent um, consent notices. And I, I do, it does seem to me that it is really a way to get around this and that there's a high chance that if you are trying to seek consent massively far in advance of the time for consent, then you're going to find someone saying, well, that's not really the reason. And so you've not really complied with rule 3.54. That would be quite um, a, a serious defect. Um, if you couldn't work it out um, from the other sources. So be careful of that one. Um, so once you've got past those, there's some relatively straightforward principles for, for how the court is deciding it. Um, uh, the uh, ultimate test is just um, they'll give you an extension if it's in the interest of the creditors of the company. Um, they have to have regards all the circumstances in doing so, uh, including whether the uh, purpose of the administration remains reasonably likely to be achieved, uh, whether any prejudice would be caused to creditors and any views expressed to creditors. Um, normally, you'll have, you'll have gone to your certainly your secured creditors and asked for them to say, yes, this is OK. Um, and uh, given that they're often the, the predominant interest, and that's often sufficient. Um, Ray TPS um, provides perhaps a different gloss on this by looking at the questions the court should ask itself in order to determine whether the principles above are met. Um, a few key points that I think are, are surprisingly often left out is um, firstly, clearly identifying which purpose of the administration the administrators are currently interested in. Um, so you might have started seeking to rescue the company as a going concern, but now be focused on distribution. Well, that's you know something that you want to make uh, clear to the court because they're more likely to um, uh, perhaps be sceptical of rescuing the company as a going concern. Whereas if you're simply focused on distribution, well, you know, there's no reason to, for example, send it into winding up when a liquidator is going to be doing basically the same thing. Um, the other one is, is dates to contextualize key delays. And you want to show that you've been progressing the administration and saying something like, um, you know, HMRC has been dragging it out. Uh, might not be sufficient if you only went to HMRC a month or two before you're making application. So make sure that you're making very clear when the problems arose and, and why it's taken this long. Uh, and uh, being very clear with the dates is very uh, useful. Uh, finally, uh, in terms of uh, values uh, realised or expected to be realised from past or future actions. This can be difficult sometimes, for example, if the reason the administration is going on is because um, you're trying to settle a claim or, or piece of litigation, uh, you know, the value of that is, is uh, as uh, we should all know, uh, often a coin toss. Um, but giving the court some uh, good indication of that so the court can help assess how that plays into the purpose of the administration would be useful. You know, often I'll be asked, you know, what are these numbers um, telling me? And the IP won't always have made that clear. Uh, finally, um, remember the practice direction on insolvency proceedings. Um, if you make this too late, you won't get your costs. And um, that's to encourage you to make it in time, although you should really be doing that anyway, um, because if you make it too late, the administration might lapse because it's been a year, and then you won't be able to get your extension at all. Uh, finally, um, what happens if it's absolutely gone wrong uh, and the administration has in fact lapsed? Well, in that case, you're going to have to seek a retrospective administration order. Uh, and that comes from a uh, interesting reading of paragraph 13 of Schedule B1 to the Insolvency Act 1986. Uh, and that effectively says um, uh, an appointment of an administrator by administration order takes effect at a time appointed by the order. There's a line of authorities going back that says, well, if the order appoints in the past, there's nothing against that. It's there. Now, the originating line of authorities on this actually didn't examine um, the main case on retrospective effect in statute and procedure, um, which is uh, Hoffman Roche uh, and uh, Intercontinental Pharmaceuticals Limited, and which basically said that you should never um, presume that these things have retrospective effect unless Parliament makes it very, very clear because of the way that um, uh, people's rights are impacted by retrospective orders. Nevertheless, um, retrospective administration orders have survived up to the present date of you know, 16 years since um, Ray G Tech construction um, and are, are regularly relied upon. So they seem fairly safe, although it is worth noting they've only ever been dealt with at, at first instance. So we have to hope that uh, the Court of Appeal doesn't decide to wildly upset the apple cart, uh, as unlikely as it seems. 
What is clear is that these are not extensions. They are applications for administration, and they must meet the usual requirements uh, of uh, making a, a, an application for administration. Now, uh, those are in some respects quite straightforward because um, uh, you can get administration order where the company is uh, likely uh, to become unable to pay its debts. Um, and the administration order is reasonably likely to achieve the purpose of administration. You think the latter is true if you were going to seek an extension anyway, and uh, if the company um, was going to be able to pay all of its debts, well, it would have probably exited administration anyway. So the fact you're here means both of those are probably true. What's worth very brief consideration is um, that an application to the court for administration order in respect of a company um, can only be made by uh, the company, the directors of the company, uh, one or more creditors of the company. And you might be thinking, well, hang on. Um, these people who aren't even administrators now, because the administration has lapped, what's their standing? Um, and the answer to that is provided by Ray Elgin Limited, which says they have standing because when they were initially appointed, they'll have accrued fees conducting the business of the administration. And then because they have those uh, fees that have been raised, they're now creditors of the company. So they can bring it under uh, 12.1c that you can see at the bottom there. Be very careful because this won't apply if the uh, administration was flawed from the very beginning, only if there was um, an initially valid appointment, um, which then was not extended um, properly. Um, so retrospective um, uh, aspects are to be exercised with extreme caution, uh, and that's because of the effect on different groups of creditors, because there are, there are different consequences for interest that you can see referred to there, uh, depending on uh, when or when not the um, administration arose. Um, ordinarily, you would say, well, look, there was going to be an extension. Um, all of the unsecured creditors provided deemed consent, and maybe we failed because we didn't go to the secured creditor. So at the time, they wanted an extension, and that's sort of like saying they wanted there to be an administration in place. So can we get one? But you have to be a little careful with that, because what people would have said then isn't necessarily the same as what they said now. So it still is important to focus on how you are protecting the interests of all of the creditors, um, notwithstanding um, the effects that it's going to have on interest. Uh, finally, um, if you suspect this is a problem, get it sorted out immediately. Um, the court will not go around the restrictions on extension um, by granting back-to-back -back administration orders. Um, uh, given that the initial um, appointment last year, that means the court won't make a retrospective administration that takes place more than 364 days before the end of the order. And the final very important procedural point on that is that if you have doubt about whether your extension is valid, and you're considering whether you need to make a um, retrospective administration application or an application for extension. If it was an extension alone, it would go into the High Court and then it would normally be transferred off to be heard by a district judge. But under practice direction um, uh, insolvency proceedings 3.3, district judges cannot hear applications uh, for administration orders, which means it could come before them. They could say this extension wasn't valid and then be unable to fix it using a retrospective administration order. So if this happens to you and it gets transferred out, then just draw that to their attention and say there's a possibility this may need an administration order and see if you can get it transferred back as quickly as possible so you don't run out of time. So that was uh, everything that uh, I was going to be uh, covering today. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, new questions in the chat, then let me know. But otherwise, thank you very much for uh, attending today. Uh, and uh, if uh, you are interested in the area of charities um, or, or that area of practice, um, then we do have uh, our next uh, junior program with Matthew Mills and Amber Turner, um, which is going to uh, be dealing um, in that area. So um, hopefully you look forward to that. Uh, and otherwise, um, as in James's case, my uh, slides will be available. Thank you. Thank you.